Zemi Nazam. I'm a senior SRNA at Kaiser. Um, I recognize a lot of your faces because I've rotated to your facilities or um, I will rotate to your facility eventually. Um, some of you I may not see again, so uh, you may be the luckiest ones in the room. So, um, first of all, I'll just say thank you on behalf of the students just hearing you guys talk and seeing how much thought goes into uh, producing an SRNA and transitioning us to CRNAs. I know you guys are very dedicated. We just show up and we have access to scrubs and charting and we start putting patients to sleep and I know it's not magic. So um, thanks for everything you guys do in the background. So to pay you back, I'm gonna give you a lecture on acid base. Um, <laughs> that I hope you will never ever forget. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of uh, acid base and our understanding of acid base. Also I'll talk a little bit about the pH scale and how that came to be. Uh, we'll get into the physiology of how our bodies maintain homeostasis as far as a very narrow pH range uh, in the absence of pathology. Then I'll talk about what do we do right now, like today, when we think our patient is acidotic, uh, what labs we order, how do we diagnose it, how do we treat it, what mental model do we use to view acid-based disturbances. And then I'll introduce a novel approach to acid-based management. It's called the physiochemical approach. And uh, I think it'll greatly enhance your understanding of acid-based disturbances and how you view acidosis in your patients. So let's get started. So other than the free lunch and uh, warm and fuzzy feelings, I'm not gonna get anything for giving this talk. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Sass. Uh, so you're gonna get my unadulterated opinion about uh, acid base. So, when your patient has an acid or base disturbance, it's actually just indicative of a more underlying pathological process going on in your patients. And all we see on the surface level is acidosis. So it's important for us as clinicians to understand not just that our patient has a metabolic acidosis, for example, but to know the specific ideology of the acidosis. What's causing the metabolic acidosis? Because research shows that knowing the cause of the acidosis and treating the cause is what's gonna uh, affect the morbidity or mortality of your patients. So we have to have a thorough understanding of acid base. So by the time I'm, time I'm done talking, I hope you guys will be able to verbalize some of the physiological principles that I'll discuss about how we maintain acid base balance. Also, I hope you'll be able to verbalize the current method that we use to manage acid base disturbances, um, including the henderson Hasselbeck method. And lastly, I hope you can itemize some of the principles of the physiochemical approach and maybe uh, make some statements about how it could enhance the care you can provide to your patients. So a little bit of the history. So our understanding of acids and bases has evolved over time. And depending on how you define what is an acid, what is a base, that could influence the narrative that you use to describe acidosis in your patients. So I'll tell you what that means. So in the 1890s, uh, there was a guy named Svante Arrhenius, so he defined an acid and a base. He said an acid is any substance when you put into an aqueous solution, it will donate a hydrogen ion to that solution. And he said a base is any substance you put into a solution, it will donate a hydroxyl anion, which is OH-. So this definition is fine, although one of the side effects of this definition is, he says an acid is anything that donates a hydrogen ion. Uh, which is true, but then it leads us in our narrative to say, okay, there's hydrogen ions in the extracellular fluid or there's excess hydrogen ions here. It just sort of leads to a technically incorrect understanding of hydrogen ions. So because we're mostly made of water, the hydrogen ions <coughs> combine with H2O and it forms hydronium anion. So in our bodies, in reality, there's very little just free floating hydrogen ions. Mostly it's H3O. But you'll hear even in, in my own talk, I'm gonna say hydrogen ions this and hydrogen ions that because I don't have the credibility to change the way people talk about acidosis. Okay, so the next definition is from two other researchers. Their name is Bronsted and Lowry. So they took Arrhenius' definition of acid and they said, okay, that's correct. It's uh, any substance that donates a hydrogen ion and proteinizes the uh, solution. But they said a base, instead of something that donates a hydroxyl anion, they said a base is anything that receives the hydrogen ion from the acid. So this reaction always occurs in pairs. So you have an acid and a base in an aqueous solution. The acid donates the hydrogen ion and becomes a conjugate acid. The base accepts the hydrogen ion and becomes a conjugate base. So the problem with this definition is now we've defined base as something that accepts a hydrogen ion. 
So now in the OR, your patient's acidotic and the bicarb's low and there's a base deficit, your knee-jerk reaction is always, let's give something that accepts hydrogen ions. Let's give a base, let's give sodium bicarb. But there's a lot of research out there now uh, demonstrating that that's not always the best solution unless your patient has a reason to have an acute loss of sodium bicarbonate. Most of the time it's a relative loss of bicarbonate and just throwing bar cover at your patient in a cookie cutter fashion isn't the best thing for your patient. It's not a harmless drug by itself. So then came the pH scale. So this guy named Soren Sorensen, he grew tired of how people were measuring acid during his time. So during his time, it was more a qualitative measurement of how acidic a solution was. They would use a colorimetric tool and see how acidic a solution was. He wanted something more definitive. So he did some research and he found that if you have a solution and you stick electrodes in the solution, you could measure the electrical activity of the solution and you could correspond that electrical activity with ionic gradients. Now when we say ions, I'm talking about hydrogen ion. So he coined the term pH, which stands for pondus hydrogeny, and it translates to the power of hydrogen. So pH is a negative logarithmic scale, this is a simplified version. So it kind of makes sense, the more hydrogen ions you have in the body, because it's a negative log logarithmic scale, the lower your pH will be. Okay, so with some of the history out of the way, let's talk a little bit about how our bodies maintain uh, acid-base balance. So I'm mostly gonna talk about the respiratory and the renal system, uh, because those are the major players. But you should know that the hepatic system plays a big part as well. It metabolizes uh, organic anionic acids like uh, lactate and ketones. But uh, for the sake of brevity, I'll just talk about the lungs and the kidneys. And then I'll introduce uh, various buffers as well, both intracellular and uh, extracellular buffers. So that's the Krebs cycle. And I know you guys want me to just talk about this for an hour. <laughs> so it's cellular metabolism, and I just want to focus on one part of the Krebs cycle, which is the byproduct of carbon dioxide. So if this accumulates, it'll be a poison in our bodies, it'll cause cardiovascular suppression. Um, so obviously we need a way to get the CO2 out. So the, it just so happens that CO2 travels in our body uh, mostly in three different ways. So as the blood goes distally to the tissues through the capillaries, there's three ways that CO2 leaves the tissue and goes into our bloodstream. The first way is just simple diffusion, and the CO2 simply uh, exists in our plasma, and about 7% of our CO2 travels in our bloodstream as dissolved uh, in plasma. The second way CO2 travels in our blood, I think is the most interesting. So when hemoglobin enters a uh, environment, uh, low in oxygen, high in hydrogen ions, low in pH, there's a conformational shift that happens in the shape of the hemoglobin, which affects the affinity hemoglobin has for oxygen and CO2. So it decreases the affinity uh, hemoglobin has for oxygen, so ox uh, hemoglobin offloads oxygen to the tissue. It increases the affinity hemoglobin has for CO2, so it binds CO2 from the tissue. And this is known as the Bohr effect. So another way to think about the Bohr effect is imagine the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Around a PaO2 of 60 and less, there's that precipitous drop in the saturation of hemoglobin. That's because at the tissue level, the PaO2 is low, so hemoglobin lets go of the oxygen uh, very readily. So the third way uh, CO2 travels through our bloodstream um, is rep represented by that equation on the purple cell. So that's the bicarbonate carbonic acid buffer system equation. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that because it's gonna come up over and over again in my talk. So, Carbon dioxide that comes from the tissue gets hydrolyzed and forms carbonic acid. Carbonic acid rapidly dissociates into bicarb and hydrogen ions. So this reaction would occur at a certain pace without any external influence. But it just so happens that our bodies, uh, particularly our red blood cells and our endothelial cells, they have this enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. And it's the fastest acting enzyme in the human body. So it increases the speed of this reaction by 25,000 times. And so in the next slide, I'll show you why it has to speed up this reaction so much. So once the CO2 uh, is collected from the tissue and it goes into the pulmonary circulation, now it's at the alveolar capillary membrane. So there has to be a way for the CO2 to get out. So the 7% of CO2 that's existing as dissolved in our plasma, it simply diffuses across into the alveoli and it's ventilated out into the atmosphere. The 23% of CO2 that's bound to hemoglobin dissociates from carbaminohemoglobin to just hemoglobin and CO2, and then the CO2 diffuses across and it's ventilated out. So this last way CO2 leaves, I think, is the most interesting. So 
The, just how hemoglobin in the tissue level is the Bohr effect, there's another effect that happens at the lung level. So when hemoglobin is in an oxygen-rich environment, it changes the uh, shape of the hemoglobin and it affects the affinity of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin begins to bind oxygen more readily and it lets go of CO2 more readily. That's known as a Haldane effect. So you can see O2 is diffusing across onto the hemoglobin and as the, the oxygen binds to the deoxyhemoglobin, it forms oxyhemoglobin. And you can see that it also forms a hydrogen ion. So essentially oxygen acidifies hemoglobin to a little bit, it protonizes it. That hydrogen ion goes up and it participates in that same equation that I told you about already, the bicarbonate carbonic acid equation. You can see the bicarb, which is how 70% of the CO2 travels in our bloodstream, diffuses into the cell. Because bicarb has a negative charge, something else negative has to leave the cell because of law of electron neutrality. So a chloride leaves the cell. That's known as the hamburger shift. So it goes through the reaction, and with the help of carbonic and hydrase, it occurs 25,000 times faster, and then the CO2 goes to the alveoli and is ventilated out. So the reason carbonic and hydrase has to make this reaction occur so rapidly is because the hemoglobin only spends about 0.75 seconds within the pulmonary transit. So in that short amount of time, that bicarb has to quickly turn into CO2 so that it can be ventilated out into the atmosphere. So that's enough for the lungs, so now the kidneys. So just imagine that this is the proximal convoluted tubule. So the urine will go through the glomerulus and then it'll reach this area. The left side of the picture is the actual intraluminal environment where the urine is produced. The middle section of the picture is the walls of the proximal convoluted tubule, and it's the intracellular environment of the wall. The right side of the picture is the paratubular capillary that's wrapping around the nephron, and it's actively reabsorbing substances into the systemic circulation. So in the urine, you have bicarb and hydrogen ions. They combine to form carbonic acid, and then they form water and CO2. And then the water and CO2 diffuse into the intracellular environment of the PCT, and it goes into the same reaction except in reverse fashion with the help of carbonic and hydrase. So you might be wondering, why doesn't the bicarb and hydrogen ion just diffuse into the intracellular environment directly? Well, the charge that they carry prevents them from uh, going across the liquid bilayer. So first it has to become water and CO2, diffuse across, and then go through the reaction in reverse fashion and become hydrogen ion and bicarb again. So you see the hydrogen ion gets pumped back into the urine so it can participate in this reaction with the next bicarb that comes around. Look what happens to the bicarb. The bicarb gets reabsorbed into the paratubular capillary to go through systemic circulation where it can buffer the hydrogen ions that are in our systemic circulation. And this is how the kidneys help us buffer our acid base. So if the hydrogen ion, it's kind of a busy picture but just kind of focus on the middle section. If the hydrogen ion is not participating with the, another bicarb to go through that reaction, it actually can get excreted out. But it doesn't get excreted as hydrogen ion. What usually happens is the hydrogen ion combines with the urinary buffer. So in this example, it's sodium hydrogen phosphate. So the hydrogen ion combines with sodium hydrogen phosphate and forms sodium dihydrogen phosphate. And then the sodium dihydrogen phosphate is sort of like a titratable acid that can get urinated out of the kidneys. This is another example of the same bicarbonate carbonic acid buffer system equation. I'm not gonna really talk about it that much because I've already talked about that equation quite a bit. But this is the metabolism of methionine into sulfuric acid and it just shows how that reaction can convert sulfuric acid into a weaker acid that can be excreted from the kidneys. So hemoglobin, hemoglobin is one of the most underrated buffer systems in the body. So the CO2 that's produced at the tissue level diffuses into the erythrocyte, so this is a red blood cell. It combines with water and with the help of carbonic anhydrase, again, our favorite equation by now, <laughs> it forms bicarb and hydrogen ion. So you can see the bicarb gets shifted out of the cell and that's how 70% of the CO2 trans transfers around and the chloride comes in. That's another example of the hamburger shift that I showed you guys earlier. Look what happens to the hydrogen ion. It binds to an intracellular protein in the, in the red blood cell. And the most abundant intracellular protein in the red blood cell is the hemoglobin molecule. So hemoglobin is actually a major player in buffering uh, acids in our body. This is an example, not really a buffer system, but just another mechanism our body has to deal with uh, acidemia. So if you have acidosis, you have an ex excessive amount of hydrogen ions in the extracellular fluid. 
these hydrogen ions go down the concentration gradient to the intracellular fluid. And because of the law of electroneutrality, something else positively charged has to leave the intracellular fluid to go to the extracellular fluid. So potassium is the most abundant intracellular positively charged ion. So potassium goes down its concentration in concentration gradient, sorry, to the extracellular fluid. And this is why in acidemia you often see hyperkalemia. So the bones, so some of the sources that I saw said that the bones can buffer up to 40% of an acid load. So how do they do it? So blood uh, that's rich in hydrogen ions uh, circulates around the body and it gets to the bones. The bones absorb some of the hydrogen ions and they release its own positively charged ions such as sodium bicarbonate and calcium bicarbonate. So essentially the bones demineralize themselves in order to buffer our plasma. Um, so if you have a patient with chronic renal acidosis, for example, um, they often have osteopenia and osteomalacia. And the reason, so one reason is they can't filter phosphate, so the calcium levels go low. And because the calcium's low, the parathyroid hormone goes up and causes bone resorption. But another reason they're demineralized is because of this, because of excessive hydrogen ions. And to maintain a balance, it gets rid of its own calcium and sodium bicarbonate. Okay, so with some of the physiology out of the way, what do we do right now when we think our patient has an acid-based disturbance? First of all, why is acidosis bad? I mean, there's a reason we're talking about this. So, acidosis can cause cardiovascular suppression, CNS depression. It could basically affect any organ system in our bodies. Uh, makes our own adrenergic receptors less responsive to both endogenous and exogenous catecholamines. So, it's important for us to understand how can someone get acidotic and how do we treat it. So there's three broad categories of acidosis. The first is a bicarbonate loss, which arguably might be the only reason you want to give your patient bicarbonate, unless your patient has an extremely low pH, like less than seven. So how do you lose bicarbonate? You could have diarrhea, you could have pancreatic fistula, or you could be on a diamox or a, a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, and you're not reabsorbing enough bicarbonate. That's one way you can get acidotic. Another way is you have an increase in acid load. So this could be you gave a patient too much normal saline and now they have hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis or they're hypoperfused and they have lactic acidosis or they're a new type 1 diabetic or non-compliant and they have diabetic ketoacidosis or any other high anion gap acidosis, which I'll talk about high anion gap acidosis later, that can cause an increased acid load and cause an acidotic state in your patient. Another reason is you have kidney failure and you're just not uh, filtering out the acids or reabsorbing enough bicarb. So, when we think our patient's acidotic, we usually get an ABG. So, when you send the blood to the gas, uh, blood gas analyzer, you get all of these values and sometimes even more. So, how does the blood gas analyzer give you these values? So, some of it, it measures directly. Some of it, it gives it to you through algorithms and formulas. So, the pH, just like Soren Sorensen's uh, experiment, the blood gas analyzer has electrodes and it goes into the arterial blood and it measures the electrical activity in the arterial blood. It compares it to a reference value and it can measure the ionic gradient based on the electrical activity and in that way it gives you your pH. The PO2, so the same electrodes, they have a phosphate coated membrane. As O2 goes across this membrane, it generates a current and the blood gas analyzer compares the current to a reference value and in that way it can give you your PaO2. The PCO2, it's the same electrodes that measure pH, it's covered in a semi-permeable membrane. It measures the hydrogen ion activity between the electrode and the membrane, and it uses the uh, bicarbonate carbonic acid equation, and it says that, okay, this much CO2 would be responsible for creating this much hydrogen ion activity, and that's how it gives you your CO2. So the rest of these measurements, it can't measure directly, uh, it gives it to you via calculations of formulas. So the bicarb, all the machine does is it uses a version of the henderson hasselbalch equation, and because it's already measured pH and it's already measured PCO2, it plugs it into this equation and it calculates what the patient's bicarb is for you. Base excess, so this concept came about because there was this scientist named Van Slyke, and he was like a total jerk because he would inject dogs with acid. <laughs> and um, he, he noticed that these dogs uh, weren't getting acidotic and so it uh, led to the discovery of alkali reservoirs and the concept of base excess came about. So base excess basically is, if you have a base excess, that means you have uh, too much base in your body. Another way of thinking of it is how much acid do I have to add to this patient's blood to normalize the pH of 7.4? Or if your patient's acidotic and you have a base deficit, 
then the idea is how much base would I have to add to this patient's blood to neutralize a, a pH of 7.4. So if your blood gas analyzer says you have a base excess of negative 6, that's actually a base deficit of 6. And if your blood gas analyzer says you have a base excess of 4, then that truly means you have a 4 extra base and you'd have to add acid to the patient to neutralize the patient down to a pH of 7.4. The SAO2, it just takes your oxyhemoglobin and it divides by your total hemoglobin and in that way it gives you how much of your hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen. So, um, we don't always have the capability of getting an ABG, um, especially intra-op, if our patients don't have A-lines or if their arms are tucked and you don't have access to their arteries. And also, even if you do have access, you can make the argument that you don't always need arterial blood. Uh, puncturing the artery isn't without its own risk, aneurysms, hematomas, dissections. So sometimes you can use venous blood and you can use the same uh, approach and evaluate someone's acid-base status. So there's certain conditions. If you think your patient's hypoxemic, you can't use venous blood because by definition, PaO2 is arterial blood. If your patient is profound septic shock or they're really hypercapnic like COPD or respiratory failure, then the correlation between venous blood and arterial blood becomes too great and you can't use venous blood as a surrogate anymore. But as long as those conditions don't exist, you can use venous blood. Uh, often it's much less risky or if you, have a, if you have a really good IV, you can just draw back on it and you can use a VBG instead of an ABG. So that brings us to the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So, henderson hasselbalch is the equation that was taught to us, uh, not directly, but it's the foundation of how we analyze ABGs right now. So we get our ABG, we look at the pH, we less than 7.35, higher than 7.45, and then you look at bicarb, and you see is it metabolic, is it respiratory, is it compensation, is it not compensation? All of that is based on the henderson hasselbalch equation. So it's important to understand how the equation came about. So there was this guy named uh, Lawrence Henderson, and he wanted a way to know how does bicarb and how does CO2 affect the acidity of blood? How does it affect the uh, concentration of hydrogen ions? So he took the bicarbonate carbonic acid equation and he tweaked it and he came up with this. This is the Henderson equation. And it kind of makes sense. So CO2 is on the numerator. So we know res respiratory failure, you have a high CO2. And since it's on the numerator, that means you have a lot of hydrogen ions. Similarly, bicarb is on the denominator. So if you have a low bicarb, the number on the right side will be greater, which means the hydrogen ion will be greater. Uh, greater. So then came another guy, his name was Carl Hasselbach. So he took Henderson's equation, but he didn't really want to know bicarbon CO2's impact on hydrogen ions. He wanted to combine Henderson's equation with the pH scale that was just invented by Soren Sorensen. So he wanted to know how does bicarbon CO2 affect someone's pH. So he modified Henderson's equation, and this is the henderson hasselbalch equation. And again, if you take time and look at the equation, it, it looks fancy, but it makes sense. If the bicarb's high or low, you can predict what it would do to your pH based on this equation. So, so far this seems like a really good uh, system. I mean, it gives you a picture of your patient's metabolic side through the bicarb and the respiratory side through the CO2. But obviously I'm dissatisfied because there's still more to my lecture and I'm going to tell you a new way you can do things. So, what is the problem with the henderson hasselbalch method? So, there's several limitations. First of all, it'll only tell you, okay, your patient has a metabolic acidosis, but then that's it. It doesn't tell you what caused that bicarb to go low in the first place. Uh, what is the specific etiology of the acidosis in your patient? Remember, the etiology is what dictates the morbidity and mortality in your patient. So you have to know what caused that bicarb to go low. And if you don't know what caused it to go low, how do you treat it? So the henderson hasselbalch method, all it kind of leaves you with is a bicarbonate-based mentality. So the bicarb's low, I'm just going to give bicarb to the patient, and it's going to accept the hydrogen ions, and it's going to make the numbers look better. And it does make the numbers look better, but it doesn't affect morbidity and mortality, and it doesn't do anything good for your patients. It sort of just pads your stats, so to speak. So the henderson hasselbalch method also doesn't tell you how does albumin affect your acid-base status, or lactate, or most importantly, strong ion difference. So I'll talk about these variables uh, moving forward. So there is a better way, there is a more comprehensive way, and if we view acid-base disturbances using a physiochemical approach, you'll have a much more broadened understanding of your patient's um, acid-base status. So a man named Peter Stewart was also dissatisfied with the Henderson-Hasselbalch method, and he wanted 
to reintroduce physiochemical principles into acid-base management and how do ionic changes in patients cause acid-base uh, changes. So he introduced a physiochemical approach. He used three laws of physics, and uh, I'm only going to talk about the law of electroneutrality because it's the most relevant to us. So that law states that your body is consisted of positively charged ions and negatively charged ions, and those ions have to equal each other at all times. And that's sort of the foundation of this approach. According to Peter Stewart, he says, bicarb is not an independent variable that predicts your patient's acid base status. Bicarb itself is dependent on other ionic phenomenons occurring in your body that cause bicarb to go up or down. So he said the predictors of acid-base status are CO2, which we already know, total weak acid, which the most abundant total weak acid in our bodies is albumin, and strong ion difference. So let's talk about strong ion difference. So strong ion difference is you take the cations in your body and you subtract it from the anions in your body. So you take the strong cations and the strong anions and you subtract them, and that is your strong ion difference. So what exactly is a strong ion? So table salt is an example of a strong ion. A strong ion is anything that when you put it in water, you mix it up, it totally dissociates. So here it shows sodium is floating by itself, chloride is floating by itself, the water molecules are floating by themselves, and nothing is attached to each other. So sodium is the most abundant, positively charged, strong ion in our body. Chloride is the most abundant, negatively charged ion in our body. So therefore, they are the key determinants of acid-base status in terms of strong ion difference. So there's a formula for strong ion difference, very simple, sodium minus chloride. So our normal sodium level in our body is about 140, normal chloride is 102. So our normal strong ion difference is 38. So this is a gamble gram. And there weren't any good ones on Google, so I had to make one myself. <laughs> and this is, I think, the best one you could find because it's the most updated as far as ion gap goes. So if you can understand this slide, you probably understand like 99% of my talk. So strong ion difference, we said sodium minus chloride. So you can see on the left side are all the positively charged ions in our body. And you can see how small of a section hydrogen ions, calcium, potassium, and magnesium take. But sodium, because we have about 140 of it, it takes up the most. The right side is all the negatively charged ions in our body. Chloride makes up the most, around 102 milliequivalents per liter. Then we have bicarb, we have albumin, we have lactate, and we have strong iron gap. So that section is, represents a strong ion difference. Those are some normal levels for strong ions. So a normal strong ion difference is 38. So it just so happens that as your patient trends to a strong ion difference less than 38, your patient's trending towards acidosis. If your patient's strong ion difference trends towards above 38, they're trending towards alkalosis. And so why is that? So imagine this is your patient, this is their uh, chem panel, and imagine you give them three or four liters of uh, normal saline. So with each bag of normal saline, their chloride level is slowly creeping up. So because of the law of electroneutrality, the positives and negatives have to equal each other. So if something negative increases in quantity, something else negative has to decrease in quantity to keep the left and the right side balanced. So what do you think decreases in quantity on the right side? Bicarb. Bicarb. Very good. So if you understand that, then you finally understand the concept behind hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. Chloride levels go up, bicarb levels shrink down, so there's less bicarb to buffer the hydrogen ions and you get a metabolic acidosis. So I can demonstrate that here. So let's say instead of 102, your chloride is 110. So now your strong ion difference is 30. Anything less than 38 trends towards acidosis. So pay attention to your chloride, it's gonna increase. So it increased and the bicarb level squeezed down and that causes acidosis. So what's really happening, your kidneys are detecting an increase in negative charge from the chloride. And so instead of reabsorbing bicarb into the paratubular capillary, it's dumping the bicarb. So anything else on that right side, if it increases in quantity, it will decrease your bicarbonate concentration. So lactate. So if lactate increases in quantity, the bicarbonate will squeeze down and it causes a lactic acidosis. Strong ion gap is the top one, and I'll talk about what consists, uh, what makes up the strong ion gap in a little bit, but if you have a high strong ion gap, your bicarbonate will shrink down and then you'll have a high strong ion gap acidosis, 
but you may have heard high anion gap acidosis. It's the same thing. So here's a chart basically showing the physiochemical approach. Uh, we'll start with CO2 because I think it's the one we understand the most. So it's the square. The middle of the screen is your patient's baseline CO2. As you go to the right, the CO2 concentration is increasing. So imagine respiratory failure. CO2 concentration increases as you go to the right. As it increases, your pH drops, and we already know that. But look at your strong line differences. We've just learned about that. It's the diamonds. So the middle is your patient's baseline strong line difference. Let's just say it's 38. As you go to the left, the strong line difference is getting less and less and less because maybe their chloride is going higher and higher and higher, and their strong line difference is getting less, and the bicarb is squeezing down, and so they get more acidotic. So you see, as you go to the left, the pH gets lower. This is another chart demonstrating the same effect. So the green is your serum chloride level. As your chloride goes up, the orange is bicarb. Your bicarbonate will go down, and your strong iron difference will go down as well. And both of those will cause an acidosis. So the henderson hasselbeck method doesn't talk about this at all. So you can see how you can have a huge blind spot in your patient's acid-base status if you're not aware of strong ion differences. So I said I'll talk about the strong ion gap, so that's the top right section. So strong ion gap. So when you hear the word gap, think a gap in your knowledge. So you don't know what's in the strong ion gap. And you don't know because we don't have the laboratory technology to measure these things. So there are anions that are hidden. They can accumulate in quantity and they can cause your bicarb to go low and they can cause acidosis, but you can't measure it directly. So it's a hidden cause of acidosis. So just like all the other negatively charged items, if it increases in quantity, the bicarb will decrease and you'll get acidosis. So there's various uh, mnemonics or so that you can use to memorize uh, what makes up a strong ion gap. Uh, cat mud piles is one, another one is slumped. But uh, for our purposes, some examples are like aspirin toxicity or uh, ketones in diabetic ketoacidosis, um, uh, carbon monoxide. Lactate used to be part of it, but we can measure lactate now, so it's not part of the gap. Okay, so how do we apply this knowledge? So, I mean, I just said a bunch of fancy things, but if you can't use it in the OR, then it's kind of useless. This is the equation of the Stewart approach, and I would be crazy to suggest that you take that to the OR and plug in variables and figure out your patient's acid-base status. So luckily, people who are like 10 times smarter than me came up with a way that you can apply this um, system. So it's a six-step process, and the beginning of it is essentially what you're already doing with your ABGs. So if you think your patient has an acid-base disturbance, get an ABG or a VBG. But in addition to that, also get a lactate, an albumin, and a chem panel, because it'll give you your sodium and your chloride. Step two is what you're already doing anyways. If the pH is less than 7.35, your patient has acidosis. Greater than 7.45, it's an alkalosis. And you look at your CO2. Is it respiratory or is it not respiratory? If it's not respiratory, then you assume it's metabolic and you start to dig into the metabolic side of things. Now that you have the chem panel, or a lot of these portable like point of care machines like EVL90 or ISAP will give you your sodium and chloride anyways. So you can see your strong ion difference. If it's less than 38, you know that some of your patient's acidosis is from this low strong ion difference. If it's higher than 38, then your patient's uh, a little bit alcoholic in terms of strong ion difference. Step five, you look at the lactate that comes back when you order it. So if your lactate's above two, your patient has hyperlactatemia. So some of the acidosis, imagine that lactate going up in size and imagine the bicarb squeezing down. You know some of your acidosis is from an increasing lactate. Step six is to calculate your strong ion gap. So we have to calculate it because remember, we can't measure it directly. So how do you know what makes up a strong ion gap if you can't measure it directly? You basically set up an algebra problem. So you start with what you can calculate and by process of elimination, whatever is left over is your strong ion gap. So there's the equation for strong ion gap. How you sort of read this equation is, okay, how acidotic is the patient? That acidosis is reflected as a base deficit. So how much of a base deficit do I have? And then you start chopping away at the base deficit. Okay, well, some of this base deficit is from a little strong ion difference, so you account for that. Some of this base deficit is from albumin. Some of this base deficit is from lactate. And then whatever you have left over has to be <coughs> acidosis from strong ion gap. So really quickly for albumin, I'll just tell you, 
The thing about albumin is albumin has acidic properties because it's negatively charged. So <coughs> most of the time people don't have high albumin levels that cause acidosis. Most of the time our patient population, they'll have low albumin levels. So the thing about albumin is, however acidotic your patient is right now, if they're hypoalbuminemic, the moment you correct their albumin to normal levels, just expect them to get a little bit more acidotic because you're literally adding a little bit more acid into their body. So there's the gambogram again. So what we're doing is we're taking the sodium, we're accounting for the chloride, we're accounting for the base deficit, we're accounting for albumin, we're accounting for lactate. Then by definition, whatever we have left over is that strong ion gap. So it could be aspirin toxicity, it could be ketones, it could be things that we can't measure. Any strong ion gap greater than two, so if you do this whole equation and if you have any number greater than two, you know that some of your patient's acidosis has a strong ion gap component. So let's just go through an example together so we can really solidify it. So let's say you have a 65 year old that comes to you from the ER, and he has cirrhosis, and they want to do an X lab. And the ER thought the patient was extremely hypovolemic, so they resuscitated him for whatever reason. They didn't use LR, they just used NS, and the patient got maybe three or four liters of normal saline. So what do we do when we think our patient is acidotic? We get an ABG. So this is the patient's ABG. So if you were to analyze this the way you analyze it right now, you would say, okay, this patient has a metabolic acidosis with very poor respiratory compensation, base deficit of 11.5. And if you stick with the henderson hasselbeck method alone, that's all you can say about this patient's acid-base status. You don't really know what else is causing that bicarb to go low in the first place. But since you've attended this talk, you ordered more labs, and you ordered your sodium and chloride and albumin and lactate. So we'll put all that information up there. And there's our strong ion gap equation again. So now we're gonna just start plugging in variables and we're going to chop away at that base deficit and justify that base deficit. Some of it's justified by a low strong ion difference. Some of it's justified by albumin levels. Some of it's justified by lactate. And then whatever you have left over, it's greater than two. Some of that acidosis is from a strong ion gap. So now you can say a much more detailed description of your patient's acidosis. You can say, my patient has a metabolic acidosis and there's a hyperchloremic component, there's a hyperlactatemic component, and there's a high strong ion gap component. So you have a much more broad understanding of what's exactly causing your patient's acidosis. So now you can switch to LR or plasma line, you can work on perfusing the patient a little better to bring the lactate down. Uh, you can discover maybe what is in the strong ion gap, maybe this patient took a bunch of aspirin, maybe, who knows. It gives you much more information. When you first start using this method, you could literally plug variables in like we just did in this example. But over time, when you get proficient, you literally just look at your ABG and mentally you're just looking at the base deficit and you're looking at your strong ion difference and you're just telling yourself a story, okay, some of it's from a low strong ion difference, some of it's from the high lactate, and you just kind of uh, go from there. So with this new understanding, your, your idea of fluids is going to be completely different now. So you get fluids every day. So you can calculate the strong ion difference of fluids just like you can calculate the strong ion difference of plasma. So look at normal saline. Normal saline, no matter what percentage it is, has the same amount of sodium and chloride. It's always equal. So therefore, the strong ion difference of normal saline is always zero. Anything less than 38 is acidotic. So zero is way less than 38. So this is why normal saline is such an acid-inducing type of crystalloid. Also notice that I did say no matter what concentration of normal saline, it's the same strong ion difference, and that's true but hypertonic saline ends up being a little bit more acidotic than normal saline. And the reason is, is it exerts an osmotic effect on the plasma and it draws fluid from the interstitial space into the plasma. That fluid that gets drawn into the intervascular space is acidotic as well, so it has a double acidotic effect if you give hypertonic saline. Uh, lactated ringers, strong ion difference of 28. So, you might think, wait a minute, I don't think of LR as an acidotic substance, and you said anything less than 38 is acidotic. If the strong ion difference of LR is 28, why would LR be an acidotic substance? So it turns out when you give your patient crystalloid, you're diluting their albumin level down. And so LR is just acidotic enough to offset the dilution of the acid, which is albumin. So if you dilute the albumin down, you may trend towards alkalosis, but LR is just acidic enough to keep your patient's pH right where it is. 
plasma light, strong ion difference of 50. So plasma light is an excellent crystalloid you can use if your patient's acidotic because the strong ion difference is way above 38. So look at albumin. So albumin has a triple acidotic effect on your patient. So albumin itself is an acid. It's stored in normal saline, which is acidotic. And it exerts oncotic pressure, which draws that same interstitial fluid into the intravascular space, and that fluid is acidotic. So it's a triple acidotic effect. So now I'm not saying don't ever use albumin in your patients. If they need albumin, they need it, because it could be that they're hyperperfused and the albumin will help uh, perfuse the, uh, the tissues. But just know that if you're training your patient's acid base status, just know that albumin will have that kind of a small effect on your patient's uh, acidosis. So the key message is uh, NS will trend your patient towards acidosis over time. LR will keep your patient kind of right where they're at. Plasma light will trend your patient towards alkalosis as far as strong ion difference goes. So with this new understanding, you can look at some of the literature that's out there and you can have a better understanding of why things happen the way they do. So this is a randomized control trial from UC Davis. Uh, half the patients were randomized to get saline, the other half got plasma light. And no surprises, the normal saline group was more acidotic than the plasma light group, and now you know why, because you know the chloride level went up, you know the bicarbonate squeezed down to accommodate that, and the patient got more acidotic for that reason. This is a study in France, a randomized control trial with uh, TBI patients. So half the patients got NS, the other half got LR, and um, of course the normal saline group was more acidotic. And <coughs> the surprising thing about this study is, the LR group didn't have any worse ICP or cerebral edema issues, um, but I don't think it was powered to study that specifically, so I wouldn't say you should start giving all your head patients LR, but it was just interesting. So to summarize, if you use the henderson hasselbeck method only, you're limiting yourselves uh, to looking at just two variables, CO2 and bicarb, and how those affect pH. If you broaden your view a little bit and you look at the physiochemical composition of your patients, you can see how a strong ion difference or a high lactate level or a strong ion gap or varying albumin levels cause the bicarb to go low in the first place. And then you know bicarb causes acidosis. Because you know what caused your bicarb to go down, you won't just throw bicarb at all your patients in a cookie cutter fashion. And you could like tailor your anesthetic care to your patient's specific cause of acidosis. So if you want to know more, um, I was sort of inspired uh, by this topic from EM Crit, which is an excellent podcast if you don't listen to it already. It's an emergency medicine doc who has interest in critical care. And then if you want to get to the cellular level, if you really have nothing better to do, you can go to deranged physiology, and it gets uh, pretty gory. Those are my references. And questions? So for your patient, what would you do to correct the situation that you presented in did you give plasma light? How many patients have plasma light? <coughs> I, I, I know I don't know. It's like a few places do. I think if you don't have it in your OR, I'm sure the critical care units may have it, or the pharmacy may have it, um, or LR if you don't have plasma light. Um, depending on how acidotic they are, like I said, the bicarb thing is sort of bashed on bicarb, but if their pH is very low, you can at least uh, temporize it with bicarb as you find the, the true problem of why that bicarb went low. Um, the lactate level was elevated in that patient, so I would work on perfusion, maybe improve cardiac output. Um, they had a strong ion gap component, so I would maybe research the history a little more, what brought the patient in, um, are they diabetic, is their glucose off, like, uh, is there something else that I can't measure that's causing acidosis. So in that way, I can kind of uh, attack the, the causes of the acidosis. And so with red cell, you talked about earlier, I guess there's something. Yeah. Um, if you gave red cells, that would, that would be essentially a a, uh, a buffer as well. Yeah, so I think it would be more uh, a double whammy. So if your patient has a decreased oxygen carrying capacity, you have more oxygen delivered tissues. Plus, the hemoglobin in the red blood cells could buffer. Um, it depends on how old the red blood cells are. They've been sitting around for a while, but um, it could help end organ perfusion. So yeah, I think. Any other questions? He has an ER to have one or two bags of like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know, and uh, well, I mean, even before going to OR, in the ICU I worked in, it was a neuro ICU. I mean, LR was like blasphemous, you know, and everyone was on NS. Um, so, um, in, in OR, all we use basically is LR, but yeah, I think each unit kind of has its culture, and um, I'm not sure how much they care about this stuff, but. <laughs>
Thank you.